Welcome to Home Gym History, produced by Garage Gym Radio. I am Rob, and I am known online as Vintage Weights PGH, but I'm not the reason you're here. Let's be honest. You're here because Ed Cohen, the GOAT, the legend, the greatest power lifter of all time, and from what I can tell, all-around nice guy, is my guest tonight. So welcome. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. I, you know, I watched you guys on your, um, on Instagram and that's when I messaged you guys. And I, I think you guys do a great job. I really appreciate that. That's some high praise coming from someone who's set some historical records in his life like you. So for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm hinting at it. And I, I doubt there's few listening that don't know, but just in case, let me run down a couple of accomplishments of Mr. Cohen's here. And, you know, by all means, Ed, correct me if I'm wrong. You are a world champion for over a decade. You have a laundry list of world records, 71, I believe, total world records. Frequently, you won competitions by hundreds of pounds over your competitors. You were the lightest person to cross the 2,400-pound total threshold. You hit 2,463 pounds in 1998. And then finally, just to put that all into perspective, to wrap it up, at your peak, I read a couple different places and heard on some accounts that you were about 13 to 15% better in terms of your total than any other power lifter in the world, regardless of weight class. Does that all sound pretty in yeah. line? That sounds yeah. pretty good. That's the resume? Yeah, that's good enough. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, we'll jump right into some of the history because that is what this podcast is all about. So going way back, I mean, we we're talking way, way back when you were a child, youth sports, things like that in your life. I heard that you participated in some team sports before you really got into weightlifting. And then, you know, there's that strong, like classic strongman story of the smaller guy, you know, wanting to get bigger or maybe even being bullied from yeah, what I can tell pound weakling or whatever it was. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, am I correct in uh, figuring out that you weren't bullied, but you just wanted to get bigger. Was that what it was when yeah. you were a 98 yeah. pounder? Yeah. Well, I, I played all, I mean, basketball, baseball, football growing up a lot. I wrestled a little bit in high school and then I discovered weights by watching pumping iron and used to see a lot of the old strongman stuff on TV at the time, like on Wild World of Sports and even powerlifting. And I, I tried bodybuilding and I, it just wasn't for me. And I, I saw Kaz on TV lifting and I was like, oh my God, you could be big and strong and look <laughs> like that and not have to diet and do all the other stuff. Oh, Bill I'm going to try this. And yeah, I, I took to it like a, like a duck to water. But yeah, my, my first year in high school, I, was, I wrestled at 98 pounds. I was four foot 11 and a half, 98. So if anyone's listening and thinking, man, I, I don't, I don't know if I can really achieve greatness. There you go. That's where you started 98 pounds. And that was about freshman of high school, something like that. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think, you know, greatness of course can be measured by who is the best, Oh, sure. but it's also, I never tried to be the best per se. Mm -hmm. I just tried to get better and I got better a long, 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 long time. So that's just where I ended up. The longevity of your career is, you know, just as awe striking as some of the numbers put up for sure. So back in that time where you're getting inspired, you see Bill Kazmaier on our last two episodes about strongman implements. I mean, he was mentioned, I don't know how many times when I was talking with the Kurt Locker, just a phenomenal lifter and strongman as well. So your basement gym, isokinetics. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a little, a familiar. A, just a, a dial that I turned on it okay. to make it harder. So what what are isokinetic you know machines that you started with? Um, How would you describe them? More more they run on like tension, okay. not a lot of eccentric, but more concentric. And I had like a bench press one and a leg press one, and I would just make up all these different exercises on them and go down there late at night and go crazy. So then you could adjust on a dial, you know, the tension involved and just. Yes you know, to yeah. your heart's content. Yep. <laughs> and then from there, you know, you, you're lucky enough to have a friend, Jimmy Nichols. And yeah. Jimmy Nichols and, and Ken, Universal. Kenny Rice. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Nichols first, he had a universal in his basement, an old universal machine. So that kind and, of broadened uh, things. Yeah. Like it had a whole bunch of different things and we started working out down there. Mm -hmm. And then my friend, Ken Rice, who I knew since I was like three years old, yeah, he had a, a weight set at home and we brought a bench down and his weights and 
and made up stuff as we went along. Now, I'm obsessed with weights, so I was curious. I have to ask you, and this was 40 some years ago, probably, but do you remember what were these weights? Who you remember the, the brand old, or anything? Old, old York barbell set. Nice. That's that's a good starting point. That's yeah. awesome. So you had a York barbell set down there, and this too struck out to me, stuck out to me, I should say, is that I, I realized Ken Rice, really good friend. You mentioned on a different podcast how you're still in touch with him. Oh, yeah. That, that's still a tough sell. How did you get your buddy to bring his 300 pound weight set over to your place? I don't know. It's definitely not charm. <laughs> yeah. I think his, his mom, I think he, he got stuck with the weight at home and it fell on his nose. Oh. With okay. blood all over the place and he had to uh, scream for his mom. Gotcha. So I think maybe she kind of suggested he gets the weights, the weights out of their house. Mm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm man enough to admit that I'm lifting alone with a cheap little bench, you know, I've, I got the bar stuck on me. I had to do like oh, the yeah. roll of shame. You know, I saw my life flash before my eyes the at the age of 16. Or, or tipping. Yeah, the tipping. <laughs> well, I'm sure his mother wouldn't have appreciated that clamor. and Yeah, you know. and, uh, denting the floor. Exactly. So then he comes over and he brings his weight set. Now you've got a, a basement gym. So home gym history is made. Yep. And this isokinetic machines your father picked up for you. And now you have this set up thanks to Ken Rice you're working with that but then eventually after that you, you, you branch out you join chicago health club yeah start, start going chicago there. health club ended up being bought out by bally's okay but yeah for it was health club corporation for of america and mm -hmm. uh geez i was there for a lot of years so i mean that's a transition oh. that you know is a significant one looking back on your development because we're going from a basement gym where I heard you mention once that you had to take it off the basement bar to do squats. Is that the way it worked yeah, in, a, in your basement gym? The, the, the higher bar stools that we had in the basement, I'd lay it across and nice. shimmy underneath it and take it off. The original Ed Cohen uh, squat stand. You, you got, you're going to do it. If you yeah. want to do it, you'll find a way. You'll find a way. That's right. Absolutely. I, you know, I've heard all kinds of stories of the way people, you know, improvise and there's whole Instagram accounts of that's all people do yeah. is improvise and figure out a way. So in your basement gym, you're improvising, you're, you're, you're finding a way. And now here you are in Chicago health club and there's, you know, the equipment you need. So yeah. how did you learn once you were there? How did you, you know, figure your way out? I, I, I looked at the magazines. That's all I ever did. I was pretty ADD still am. Yeah. So I was introverted and mm -hmm. I would just kind of dive into myself. And then until I, you know, kind of got the gist of everything there and everyone there. Mm -hmm. And then I started having little workout partners, which was really cool. Absolutely. And I mean, muscle and fitness, strength and health. I, I, yeah, all the old powerlifting USAs. All the old powerlifting all USAs. Yep. So you were able to learn from those plus the partners involved. But then an interesting thing that stood out to me too was this uh, garage gym that you kind of moved to from there. Mm -hmm. I heard on Dave Tate's Table Talk podcast, which by the way, to my listeners, you know, this is rooted kind of in the history of things, but if you want to really take a deep dive into the training, you and Dave Tate, wow, what a conversation. I'll drop a link whenever I he put is, this out there. I mean, he's a, he's an old meathead, but he's a really smart meathead and he does a great interview also. I couldn't agree more. So yeah, <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm, jump in there you go into setup you go into you know all kinds of detail that i learned a lot listening to that one but then i also pulled out of there francis rudiger i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing yeah. his name his garage gym so well, yo, yo, his, what's the story there his, his brother is rudy oh notre dame fame yeah that's amazing so rudy rudiger's brother has yep. a garage gym so then how'd you start going there versus the health club? What, how did that transpire? I, I don't know. It, it might've been like, uh, I'm sure I just met him at a contest yeah. and it had to be something like that. Cause it was like a 40 minute ride out there every day. Oh, and wow. I was young. Okay. So was it just the crowd there that, that was the appeal? Just, you yeah, know, just lifting a, somewhere? A, a, just a group of guys in that gym. Nice. So having that camaraderie, that kind of thing, you know, learning from each other. That was the oh, yeah. appeal. Yes, definitely. Nice. No. These gyms of yours, the home gyms, your basement gym, 
this garage gym, you know, we can all pretty much picture a commercial gym, but if, if you're painting a picture of your basement gym with, you know, Ken Rice's Olympic set and mm-hmm. everything, is this like a, you know, carpeted space with some wood paneling walls? You said you have uh, bar not, stools sitting around. No, no, no carpeting, but definitely wood paneled walls there and a go. fireplace down there and a bar. <laughs> so that was the start. And then now you're in the garage. Is this, uh, you know, Mr. Rudiger's garage, just a basic setup, a bench, power rack of some type, uh, or squat yeah, rack? Let's see. He had uh, squat racks, a bench, an incline. A, he had a uh, an old power rack, uh, a lap machine, and a leg curl machine, I think. That's not bad in a garage gym. No, it wasn't bad at all. Yeah. It worked. I'm- Smarter than I have in my gym. So yeah, that pretty nice setup. So I, I was thinking about it. It it'd be amazing to me if the people that currently live in these houses, I mean, I don't know if you have family that still live in that original house or if uh Francis Rediger still lives there in his house, but I wonder if the current owners, if it's not them, recognize, oh yeah, like the greatest power lifter of all time used to work out here. Nah, they don't even know. Oh, there needs to be a little plaque or something, you know, <laughs> maybe that'll be my mission. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll there you get go. like one of those little historical bronze plaques, you know, mm-hmm. they'll mysteriously get it in the mail. Like what the hell is this? Yeah, hang this up, please. Yeah. Ed You're- Cohen once lifted here. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I get that project started, you'll be the first to know. So I, you know, I find that fascinating, just the progression of things. And then you get to quads gym and watching Mm -hmm. videos of you over the years, you know, I've seen some videos where you have it on your, on your shirt, you know, quads gym, when I look them up, you know, still around, they started in 1975. There's a couple locations now in Mm -hmm. Chicago. Uh, What took you there? Did you make friends with owner or something? What was the origin of that? I just, I met someone at a meet that went there. Nice. And that was good enough. Right when I got there, it was mostly bodybuilders. Okay. But it was a, it was a, a very hardcore cool gym that had great equipment. So uh, they accommodated me right away. And that makes a Worked difference. Out pretty well. Yeah. I'm sure they were happy to, to have you because in the timeline of your powerlifting career, where do some of these things fall? So like your first meet was 1980. So was the garage gym experience before that first meet, powerlifting meet? No, that was, uh, I was, I think I was already at uh, Chicago Health Club at the time. Okay. Because I was, I was 16 years old. I was still in high school. And then it's a four-year track till your uh, first world in 1984. Yeah. So yeah. that's like, you know, your powerlifting college years, the four years from the start to. Yeah, I, big... just, I just grew really fast and I was obsessed. I mean, it sounds like it. Like, even just going back to the isokinetic machines, you know, into the wee hours, you know, mm-hmm. just seeing what oh, you can yeah. do, it's pushing it. Waking people up in the house, coming down and yell at me at, you know, one in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure your parents had some fond memories of that. Oh, yeah. Like, what is Eddie doing now, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, in line with that, though, fast forward to your powerlifting, you mentioned they came to just about all your meets stateside. They came to a lot, yeah. I even had him come over to uh, Austria once also. That's that's amazing. So <laughs> you must not have angered them too much with the isokinetics. No, you know? no. <laughs> they, they, they supported the career. So then what about these days? Um, you, you know, you, you've been conducting seminars. You've been, you know, coaching and training for – I shouldn't say coaching because I know you don't directly coach anyone, but you've been conducting seminars and in the – you know, strength world ever since, you know, your last competition, you've never really left. You're, you're, you're still here, very present. No, it, and, it's given me so much that I like to give back. So then as far as gym equipment, stuff like that, do you have a home gym of your own? Do you still go somewhere else? No, to work I, go out? To a little pla- I go to a little place called Lance's. Okay. Uh, right over near uh, where the White Sox park is Oh. in Bridgeport neighborhood, old, old school. And it's in the basement of the building. It's like when Rocky went back to Russia. No, you, you go there to train. You don't work out there. There's it's a big a, difference. A great place with great equipment. And Lance Carabell, I mean, he's mm-hmm. he squatted over a thousand also in the uh, old ADFBA slash USAPL. Mm. So he's no slouch. <laughs> no, so the man knows what he's doing. Yeah. So then, when it comes to equipment and training, that type of thing. Um, Along the path of your career, 
did you ever, you know, have any favorites in terms of equipment, weights, bars, things of that nature, or, you know, whatever's in front of you is no, that was the I mission. Think, I think when I was at most of my strongest, when I was at my healthiest is there wasn't all the crazy equipment that there is now. Sure. And as far as bars, we, we had to use the same bar for all three lifts. So like when I pulled like at, at 181, I had deadlifted 791 mm-hmm. and I totaled uh, over 2000 and that was on the same bar with two hour weigh-ins and yeah. the, at 198, I was, let's see, well, let's say I was, I was still 20 years old when I deadlifted 791 at 181 mm-hmm. and that's, you know, in a full meet. And a year later, you know, I'm 21 years old and I'm at 198 and I deadlifted, I squatted and deadlifted 859 in the same meet and bench 501 raw. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's one of the things about your career that just struck me years ago, whenever I was looking at your career was the, the well-roundedness of things. You weren't, you know, I'm sure your deadlift uh, records get uh, quite a bit of attention, but your squat and your bands were right there too. And I mean, your yeah, bands, they were so bad. For having for long sure. arms, they weren't bad. I just, you know, didn't listen to people. I just, again, I just tried to get better. I was going to find a way to get my bench better. Absolutely. And when it comes to your training, you know, from what I could tell, you're writing your programs. You're, you're, you're just ritualistic with it. You're going through your programs. You're the one doing the writing, things of that nature. But from a home gym perspective, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, social media coaching, things like that, or virtual coaching. Uh, there's been a lot of programs you can now download, you know, the technology's mm-hmm. at a place that it wasn't 30 years ago. But if I'm just a cheapskate home gym guy and I Google Ed Cohen program, the Mark Philippi Cohen deadlift yeah. program comes up. That was, that was actually, you know, it's funny because I just talked to Mark Philippi now. Oh, perfect. Uh, he's, he's one of the only guys I would trust with my training anyways. He's a brilliant and uh, he can work harder than anyone back in the day. And he had to work harder than me, but that was actually his deadlift routine. But I had given it to Josh Bryant and then Josh attached my name to it. I see. <laughs> so, so I that's yell the history Mark of it. All the time. <laughs> so that's actually traces back to Mark. Yeah. And then with Josh Bryant, that's where your name got mixed yeah. up. Okay. Gotcha. I gave it to Josh. Gotcha. So, Really, we're looking at the Philippine program, but yeah, code yeah. approved. You know, my, my, all my programs were really basic mm-hmm. on paper. Now, Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein had a quote that said, there's genius in simplicity. So what I got from that was everything should look fairly simple on paper, but how you set out and do it is genius. So from your everything outside the gym, like, you know, what Stan Efferding does with sleep and nutrition to, oh, yeah. He's um, a genius. Definitely. And to, then you get into your technique part and then in, you get into the exercise part. You got to pick the right exercises to complement what's wrong with you, your weakness. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. The idea is mm-hmm. to don't get a gap so big between your strength and weaknesses that something bad happens. So my whole off season was my weakness. And Just having a, that, a, yeah, that truth about yourself, that lack of ego that, hey, this is where I need to target. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed training more than competing. And, and then you got, you got to pick your numbers. And over so many weeks. And mm-hmm. I used to pick my numbers for not just squat, bench, and deadlift, but every single assistance exercise I did mm-hmm. every single week. It was all picked out in advance. And I'd run over it and run over it and run over it and run over it. Yeah. And until I knew it was all doable. So, I mean, it all has a purpose. It's all, it's all leading there. Everything I had a purpose. It, it makes sense. And it, it leads to good segue into some of these historical things I'm curious about. So, you know, I, I mean it with the utmost respect and compliment when I say that it, it's like speaking to a historical figure here with you that, you, you know, usually so far on this podcast, this is episode 12, I'm telling stories. I'm, I'm you know, this happened, that happened you're my primary source. You're, you're the first primary source I've had here. So with that in mind, you were meticulous with your programming, you know, every rep, every lift, yeah. every assistance exercise. So then, you know, 
I, it stands the reason that am I correct to assume that you would know that, okay, I'm going to break this record when I peak, like this is the meat that I'm going to hit. nine um, one. A- actually it was like, everything was based on the last count. Okay. And then I would know where to start and how, what was generally what my outcome could possibly be mm-hmm. written in, in pencil, not stone. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's well, like you just it, said, picking your numbers, picking your list. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I had a very, very good idea and a lot of success with it. Now, mm-hmm. I knew that if everything went accordingly on the day that I would do as a good chance, I would lift this and that. But when I got to a meet, I set my opener. Then I based the whole meet off my opener. Sure. You know, how were you, you that day? You, yeah, you can't, go, you can't go in there because you're not at your mm-hmm. same gym. You had, you had weigh-ins. You got different judges. You got different equipment. You got different rules you got this and that and it's not your home gym anymore no you're not in control that's that's a very good point so you knew it was within the realm of possibility that hey i might hit this record but you know it depends on the day on all those factors and many more probably that makes sense so then um you know in terms of you know you're there you set a record you know you know that you've now also won that me Mm -hmm. I'm sure that that all usually those- happened on the first attempt, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that first one probably set it in stone for you. Yeah. And I'm sure they all felt great. You know, I've seen the videos of you, you know, your celebration or jumping in the air or whatever you might do. They all felt great. But is there any one in there in particular that you remember afterwards? You know, it really kind of hitting home like, whoa, what did I just do yesterday? When I, when I, when I pulled the 901. Mm hmm. Actually, I, that was the second attempt. I opened up at 837, and I asked my friend Doug Furness, who was also an unbelievable lifter, uh, what do I need to total over 2,400? And he said 898. So I called 898, which is the kilo mark. Mm-hmm. But they had to reweigh all these weights, and it weighed out to 901. I had, t- I had tried 920 afterwards, which would have been like 924 or something. But mm-hmm. I, it was just anticlimactic. I got too fired up a little too soon. And right when I started to pull, it went, uh, Yeah. It just it died. Oh, you but talk I, a I, lot. I, I, I doubled 900 in the gym on a dead stop real easy without straps. <laughs> you talk a lot about, you know, just knowing and your body and knowing the feeling of things. So that makes sense that, you know, that, that next one, you just knew like, eh, this, this isn't going. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the thing historically I think is amazing and, and kind of a cool connection and, and, and makes it a, a cool world record deadlift uh, bookend is to Bob Peoples and his went the other way. He thought he was breaking 700 pounds and the first, so way back in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And it turned out after they waited, it was 669. So it was a yeah, little, sorry. little oh, I'm sorry, 699, I should say 699. So it was a little bit less. Whereas yeah, yours, I, it went I, the I, other I, way. It's a little bit more. So it's like, yeah. hey, you know, that's yeah, a nice that, surprise. That was definitely a bonus. Yeah. Um, that, that's like, that's what the sucks about kilos is, you know, if you want to do something at 700, it's six ninety nine ninety nine and three quarters. Yeah. The same, the same, in the, the same with the seven ninety nine and three quarters. Nope. It's not, nine, it's not 800. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it, it all counts. You, you can't yeah. claim, you can't claim it if it, if it's not what it is. So no. then, you know, just to make clear to everybody listening, if they're unaware, this 901, you were at 220 pounds, correct? Yeah, I think I weighed in 218, 218 and a half. And it was uh, two hours, two hour weigh-ins mm-hmm. under, under IPF rules, the same bar for the whole meet. And you had to pass a drug test. Now you bring up, you know, a, a couple different things and you have brought up a couple different things that are major differences and that's one of the things you and i uh that you were nice enough to message me about and that we chat a little bit about were some of the differences between when you were lifting and now and some of the records that are being set compared to your records Mm -hmm. and i mean being a student of history you go from milo in ancient greece to apollon and louis sear and then all the way through up into bill kazmaier that you saw as a kid and yourself there's differences all along the way. So it's hard to compare sometimes. 
And one of the things I really like is how respectful you are of the current lifters. You don't take anything away from them when you talk about it. You just are truthful. You just point out, hey, this is different. So there's a stiff bar when you were lifting. That's a big difference. Yeah. Versus the deadlift bars now that are used commonly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two hour weigh in now is uh, 24 24. hours. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to cutting weight, that's a huge difference. Um, Big time. And then in addition to that, the equipment itself, benches, squat uh, they're stands, pretty things like that. Pretty, pretty, they're pretty much the same specs. Okay. So not huge difference there. Well, when it comes to all of that, if you had to think about some of these current lifters that are setting records and doing things, I always think it's interesting when I see history kind of replicated or people trying a historic lift. So Mark Henry lifted, I spoke about mm-hmm. on an earlier episode, the Apollon's axle replica that Ivanko made or on uh, the history channel show strongest men in history, Brian Shaw's on there with his crew recreating yeah. things. If, if we were to recreate like the Ed Cohen generation setup, mm-hmm. you got a two hour way in, you have a stiff bar mm-hmm. that everybody uses all the other parameters. Who do you think would have a chance at that body weight at 901 that's lifting today? Nobody. I, I believe that's the correct answer, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, it, do, it doesn't mean they're not strong. No, not at all. Um, but I, I think that the deadlift bars now, especially the kabuki bar, the heavier mm-hmm. you get. I mean, I, I've seen some guys in the gym and during their training on, on video take a certain number. And then a couple of weeks later, they get a kabuki bar and all of a sudden it's up like 40 or more kilos. Yeah. So some of that can have an effect. It doesn't mean they're not strong. And I'm, 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 no. I, I don't really prefer that bar. A regular deadlift is, bar was sufficient enough. Mm-hmm. I think that just makes it a little bit crazier. It, it comes closer to like a uh, a bar that a strong man would use. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, strong is strong. I mean, John Heck is a strong son of a bitch. Oh. Look at his, his bench is just out of this fucking world. He's, I mean, he's just a, <laughs> he's out of this world. Uh, he really is. And, and see what, what I like. I like guys that are strong as shit and don't talk shit about other people. Yeah. And they just, you know, I lift the way I lift and that's it. That's what I like. And, you know, he, he looks like he's having fun too. He's got a Dan DeVito cut out back there Definitely. in his home gym. You know, he's, you know what? he's living his best life. <laughs> nothing hurts. And you're always walking away, away with a smile when you do well. Yeah. When you make all your lifts, nothing ever hurts. <laughs> I can imagine so. So, I mean... It would be an interesting competition in my mind. And I definitely, I, I think of John Hack or Yuri Balkan or some of these guys out there today and, and wonder to myself, man, okay. And those parameters, what, what could they do? Let's, even if you well, don't. John, John Hack would just destroy up, me in the, in the so, bench. Yeah, true. True. He's, I, and just um, his career, the way it's progressed too, has been fascinating too. Yeah. He's doing great. And he looks like Absolutely. he's having a lot of fun. Absolutely. So then, as far as training seminars, things of that nature, I've never attended one personally, but I mean, as a home gym owner, I'm usually lifting alone. So I'm blessed with the technology of today that I can record myself and mm-hmm. then watch the video playback. That's, that's a huge advantage lifters of old. Here, here, it's also a disadvantage. Okay. And why is that? You look at the video more than you go by feel. Mm, true. You didn't have that option. So you had to really tune in to yeah, so, what's going uh, on. How I developed my, well, first of all, I got legs like a Oompa Loompa and a long torso. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to lean a little bit more. Sure. And I went by feel. Did it feel good? Did it, the weights go up? Okay. Was it smooth? Mm-hmm. Now it is good. That's how I, that's how I judge everyone. If the technique looks solid, mm-hmm. whether they're close or wide or high bar or low bar, if the techniques look solid and it's all and it's smooth, then I would stick to it. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, we're all different on the inside. I don't go by, yeah. well, the measure of my femur and this. No, I want to know what's going on <laughs> on the inside. What's the angle of your hips on an MRI, your knees, your shoulders, all that kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it appealed to me and I thought to myself, all right, I need to seek out some seminars and things and, uh, you know, get out of the solidarity of my home gym because, you know, it, it it sounded appealing to get not just an expert's opinion, but just to get out there and get someone else's opinion, because I'll have a friend come over and lift or whatever, but yeah, there's nothing nothing too serious. That's that's what I had training partners for. 
Yeah, exactly. Who are now, brutally honest with me. Yeah, well, that's the big thing I think you need. And I remember you talking with Brian Shaw on his podcast recently about that, that, you know, he was saying the same thing that, you know, you don't surround yourself with yes, men. You need that. No. You need that brutal and, and You have to have the ability to hold yourself accountable. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, with a seminar that you might run, what would I be expecting? You know, what, what happens there? Do you do like a, I, I, you know, I run it as a workshop. A Q&A, a workshop. Uh, I, I, I've been to seminars, not just on lifting, but other things. Mm-hmm. And with my ADD, if I have to sit in crowd and just listen to someone all for a while, forget it. I'm, I'm thinking about lifting already by myself without listening to what's going on. Yeah. So I like a hands-on. So I will do more, run it like a workshop and I will walk around like a, a drill instructor the whole time working with nice. everybody hands-on. And after that, then we sit around and talk like, you know, fireside chat with uncle Eddie. <laughs> nice. nice. But by that time they realize that I'm good at what I do and how I go about it. But, I also tease everyone and have fun and they know I'm an idiot just like them. Yeah. So they're not as scared to ask questions and they have more of an idea of what they want to ask afterwards. That makes sense. A lot of times there's very few questions. I mean, if you've been lifting and already getting that feedback from you, yeah, you know, you get a little more comfortable. You've been, yes, definitely. you've been having fun. You've been there for a while instead of right off the bat trying mm-hmm. to raise your hand kind of thing. And, and, and I'm also fortunate enough to be, have been around some really, really smart people throughout my whole lifting career that I learned a lot about from. I got a, I, I got an excellent phone book. I can call anybody at any time. Well, that's, I, you know, I uh, have a little connection to you personally that I, I picked up Arnold's book some time ago, probably had a different cover whenever you had it. Yeah, it was. And, and, it was and, a you lot know. smaller too. It was a, a lot smaller book. Yeah, it's a little thicker now. So reading the magazines, reading the books, but also just talking with people because it's almost like when you meet another lifter, you know, I don't run into him that often. There's only one guy at my work that lifts. So mm-hmm. when you meet another lifter, it's like, okay, we're on common ground here. Let's, let's yeah. touch base. What can I learn from this guy? Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, online stuff, there's, I've really benefited from Instagram, from social media, learning. You put some great content out there on your Instagram. And that's where, you know, I've spent realistically in my life seeing you more on there than I ever, as a younger man, saw you lift. Other people have great content on Instagram and on social media for that kind of thing. But I've heard a phrase that always makes me chuckle when you say it, that sometimes people are out there for a t-shirt and a can of protein. Yep. Do you it's recall saying that? What's what do you mean when you say that? People sell their asses for fucking nothing. <laughs> you know, when when I used to go out to when I, I had a contract with Joe Weeder for some years. Mm-hmm. And I used to go out and hang out with Joe, just Joe yeah. and I. And he was nothing like anyone thought. Yeah. He was a he was an absolute riot and a lot of fun and he knew his stuff. He actually yeah. preferred strongman and powerlifting and the odd lifts than he did more bodybuilding that's interesting yeah that was his background yeah. he loved that because everything yeah. else was just you know a dime a dozen mm. and you know and i would go there and work with his writers all the time on articles yeah. and they wanted to talk to me more than a lot of other people because that's all they do is all the bodybuilding shit all the time they wanted mm. to have some fun and a lot of them a lot of these old writers are old they know the old days where you did everything, where you were a power lifter and Olympic lifter and a bodybuilder. Yeah, you did it all. Yeah, and, and being strong meant something. Absolutely. I, I had a, a conversation with Franco Colombo mm-hmm. at the Arnold Classic. I sat next to him during the Arnold Hall of Fame presentation. And it was just him and I. That's extraordinary. And I, 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 really, I, I had a semi-erection the whole time, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I've heard you say how you, Arnold, yeah. you know, a little too tall, so then you zoned in on, yep. you know, Franco being the guy to look up to because he was yeah, of shorter and, stature. And and Franco didn't like a lot of the bodybuilders mm-hmm. because they were just so one-dimensional and they couldn't do a lot. Okay. That makes but sense. But some of them are super athletic. Well, I mean, Franco, world's strongest man. I, I, I'm i a huge strongman fan. Mm-hmm. I, I love strongman uh, lifting. And so 
yeah, I was just talking about on a previous episode about 1977. He had a horrible leg injury in the fridge race, carrying yeah. a refrigerator on his back. Yeah, there was actually like a dip in the path. Mm-hmm. So not his fault. And but he did come back and compete some other times. Now, did you ever dabble in other strength sports, things of that nature? Not really. You know, you know arm at, wrestling like, or at something. Like the, at the oh god, hell no! I don't need to rip my arm off. <laughs> yeah, I went up against a friend of mine, Mike, in. Um, He's, he's very, very, very highly ranked in the country at a lighter body weight. Okay. And I hooked up with him. And right when we let go, I said, nope. And I ran away. <laughs> that was the end of your no arm wrestling way. career. <laughs> no way. But uh, in, and in Strongman, Terry Todd at like the first Arnold Strongman asked me if I, would, if I wanted to jump in. Oh, interesting. And, and I was standing next to Brian Shaw when he was young <laughs> and Phil Fister. <laughs> Yeah. And I looked at Terry and I just pointed upwards to the sky, which yeah. those guys' heads were. I said, yeah. are you kidding me? I mean, maybe the static events. You know? Yeah, maybe some grip exercises. That's about it with my hands. That's about that's, that's it. That's actually what I was going to ask because you notoriously yeah. have, you know, huge hands. I have some big hands. You got some big hands. Hold out a basketball in one hand. <laughs> which, uh, and you, you know, from what I can tell you about five, six, you said yeah. at one point, something like that. So yeah, you have huge hands. So I thought, Oh, well I- I'm into grip strength, you know, picking up blobs and, you mm-hmm. know, different implements and things like that. Have you ever tried that kind of stuff with the grip strength? No, I, I just used to do single, single arm holds. There you go. For, for, for time and weight. And, uh, that's all I ever needed. And I, I, I would do like uh, heavy competition grip, shrugs power shrugs mm. i got up like 765 for 15 reps with no straps that's that's a that's a testament to grip strength there with no yeah, straps that's work it a little bit yeah i i would say so i mean i i just get curious about that kind of thing i start when i look historically at some people that have you know george hackenschmidt the russian line mm-hmm. that you know, he got injured so he went into wrestling and uh, some people that have transferred and transcended to other strength sports I think, oh, man, Ed Cohen with those hands, it, it, he could have been uh, – there's not really any money to my knowledge in grip strength, uh, but, no. you know, for fun or just for the thrill of competing, I bet you could have, you know, really taken yeah, if some – I couldn't power lift, Taken some competitions. Yeah, exactly. Never too late. I mean – No, I, thanks. I, I'm, I'm sure someone would love to uh, hook you up with some grip strength implements and things. Yeah. You can give it a shot. Nah. If you ever come through Pittsburgh, you're welcome at I the. Uh, you're welcome at my gym. You can stop into there, my home gym and do some. Not so long ago, I was in Greensburg. Oh, okay, there you go. That's a <laughs> that's a frequent stop of mine when I'm you know going out into farm country to look for some weights in the barns and stuff like that. Dig them up. I I, I just I like the history of it and it's fun yeah. to restore them, all that kind of stuff. Oh, definitely. I used to know all the old Pittsburgh lifters. Yeah. Well, when it comes to Pittsburgh. And strength history, I was going to ask you if, uh, you know, you have any stories of Pittsburgh or coming through here. Tony Farr was a buddy of mine. Still talked to him once in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, he was he was probably the best power lifter to come out of Pittsburgh, I think. Yeah, I mean, he for sure made a name for himself. And uh, it's interesting to hear you mention him. I, I, I find these little, like, uh, breadcrumbs, if you will, you know, these little trails of Pittsburgh strength history every once in mm-hmm. a while when I'm talking with people, so I couldn't pass up the chance to ask you. And there, there, was, a, there was a real lightweight guy named Frankie Vidro. Okay. I'm unaware was, of like, him. He had a monster deadlift and then all of a sudden just quit. Hmm. Like, like, like 123 or 122, like 650 or something. Whoa. Yeah. I'm going to check into him. Frankie Vitro. Yeah, I'm unaware of him. But as far as, you know, getting back to the T-shirt and a can of protein, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, affiliate links, things like that. I have them. You know, I, <laughs> you're, I, you're, not a, you're not a sponsored athlete. That's all you get is the T-shirt and a can of protein. Exactly. And I've never gotten a T-shirt and a can of protein. I think I made about a dollar on my affiliate links. But I know that is the thing nowadays. Uh, some home gym influencers, you know, they'll review yeah, you're equipment. Just, you're, just, you're just a cheap whore. Yeah, That's exactly. You are. There you go. And and it really sometimes that was my struggle with it was you know eh so then I just paired it I just basically if I use something when I'm restoring stuff here you go here's the link and if I you know really like this company so I, there's I think three yeah. of them that I have 
No, but I, 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 without I could, naming names, there are some people out there that have you know, 20 different things, that, uh, you know. If you're on your way up and you're not at the top echelon, yeah, and which someone's I'm not. offering you a bunch of stuff, yeah, I would take it and do it. Well, I mean, I'm not even a competitive lifter. I'm not any type of elite anything. This is just a hobby, and if it helps me buy uh, some supplies for my weight restoration projects, yeah. good no, on me. This isn't just a hobby. This is your psychiatrist. But, yeah, it is. You got that right. That's the first thing I said to uh, Ed when he hopped on here before we hit record. Man, you're on the couch. I feel like I'm talking to my therapist. This is great. <laughs> well, at least you got a cool therapist tonight. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, that's I've had lengthy conversations about affiliate links and things like that with people that have said the same exact thing as you that, hey, you know, don't sell out, don't sell yourself this and that. And, you know, I, I take the stance that if it's if someone's doing it genuinely and, you know, same way you'd say, hey, I really like this podcast, check out whatever, Dave Tate's yeah, uh, why podcast. Not? Hey, it, it, it's quality. why not? As long as someone has quality yeah. that brings it to you and is, isn't yeah. a dick, that's yeah. all you care. That's all that matters. But I have, I mean, just me, who I'm not an elite anything when it comes to strength sports. I'm an average guy that's doing this for fun. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten messages from some company I never heard of saying, we love your account. Will you please be a sponsored athlete? And I'm like, what, what are you, where am yeah, I going to sponsored athlete? My ass. Am I going to put your t-shirt next to a rusty weight plate I'm working on? Like yeah. what? <laughs> I barely even show myself lifting on my account. Like, what are you talking about? Like I lifted well, some globe that, dumbbells. You, know, you, you have to mention them so many times. You have yeah. to show a banner in the background. You have to, there you go. well, what am I getting? Exactly. What are my X amount of thousands of viewers mm -hmm. that see this? What do I get out of that? Usually it's not much. Yeah, not much. So that's where it, it struck me as uh, when you were saying that comment, T-shirt and a can of protein, it made me laugh because even me with, you know, a couple thousand followers that I'm grateful for, I've been getting those offers and I'm like, goodness mm -hmm. gracious, it's out there. And unfortunately, I think some people go for it and, you know, they got their t-shirt and can of protein mm -hmm. good for them well to close out you know i want to be respectful of your time and i appreciate you being well, on. well i got more time don't worry about it oh good well two of the things that in addition to the t-shirt and can of protein i hear you say a lot it, I, you know correct me if i'm wrong they're kind of your mantras is just have fun and be nice it's I, easy. I, it, I there's you. way less stress on your life there you go. I, I mean, in your life, where's the influence coming from that? Is it just, you know, learning from mistakes? Is it from your parents? We mentioned them earlier, you know. Probably, probably a little bit of both. Definitely, I, I had really cool, good parents that treated everyone like they were their kids from the neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, I have friends of mine that not that long ago that my mom treated them just as good as, you know, me or my brothers or sister. And, um, so definitely there. And then you kind of learn, you kind of learn that, you know, when you see someone in the gym that you don't really care for to fixate on that person for more than five seconds, takes a lot of time and ruins you. Yeah. So more, ex more experience, a lot of it. You're just wasting your time, that negative energy. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Fuck, I don't need that negative energy in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the older I get and the busier I get, I have four kids, um, you know, working day job, four kids, that kind of thing. And doing this stuff on the side, I, I just don't have time for it. You know, no, your time is precious. It means something, something now. Exactly. I want to, I want to play with my kids. I want to hang out with my wife. I want to come down in the gym and work out, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't have time to bicker with some stranger online. I don't even know. And About that's why I bring nothing. it up too. the online trolls and the, you know, the goofballs, you know, it's, Oh my God. Sometimes people throw comments from shit. I did 26 years ago, 27. <laughs> They're and, coming for you. <laughs> and sometimes I will actually respond back and say, if you still have a problem with something I did two and a half decades ago, then you are the one with the problem. Not me. Yeah. That's a stretch, you know, especially when you Think about this way, too. You're talking about how the root of some of this of be nice and have fun is learning from mistakes. Well, there yeah. you go. I mean, let's not condemn someone for something they did. You know. if, if, if you start ripping on people for stuff that they used to do, then you win. 
Yeah. They lost. They're a miserable cocksucker right away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a part of learning, you know, like you're talking about lifting, how you got to feel and, you know, ah, this isn't working well, or hey, this does feel smooth. Well, same thing in life. It, 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 all goes, it, it all goes together. It all comes together. So, you know, when it comes to, um, to go back to the history of home gyms and things of that nature, we reached way back at the start here, those isokinetics, then you you got your Ken Rice Olympic plates. You know, some of the things I hear, I heard you and I've read in interviews you talk about is just the setup, you know, and you really emphasize sternum up and mm-hmm. things of that nature. Not when, just up, sternum up. Sternum up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where, where is some of that developing along the way? Are those things that you internally, are you learning, picking up little pieces, like you said, from other people you talk to, and it's just going in your arsenal? That was more you know? from me, me feeling. And I, I had a really good kinetic sense about myself. Mm-hmm. And the more I did it, the better I got and where I could identify everything right away that was wrong or right on me. And then I was able to start looking at other people and identify it on them. So I could watch you lift and I can actually feel how it feels for you. Kind of weird, but I yeah. can do that. <laughs> that's your, that's your sixth sense. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I believe it. I, I, and you know, it, you know, ev- everybody has tried and done different routines mm-hmm. and there's a lot of huge lifts set on different routines, but the one thing in common is that they know how to pick their numbers correctly at the right time. Mm. So the execution. That's, the important, that's the important part of the routine that, and then, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It's how smart, of course, as everyone says, mm-hmm. but you have to peak the right way in order to show those numbers in a contest and doing it in a gym doesn't mean anything unless you, all you do is social media bullshit. Yeah, exactly. So unless you're just, we didn't, we didn't have that in those days. Yeah. True. So, but nowadays you have the, you know, the, the amazing video, the post of your, of your big lift that mm-hmm. eh, it wasn't really in a competition. So what can you do? Yeah. I mean, garage gym competitions coming up. Uh, or actually when this comes out, I should say it will have just occurred in November. It's a virtual competition. That's pretty cool. It's, yeah, it's just for fun. And that's mm-hmm. why I, th- I think you'd like it. You know what? I, I actually think Chad Wesley Smith is doing one like that this weekend. Yep. And, um, Juggernaut AI has been a huge yeah. sponsor of Garage Gym Competition, uh, the marquee sponsor, if you will. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's a, it's just a cool thing, and it attracts people to the sport. It's it's great. It is. It's just because you like to train powerlifting, it doesn't mean you have to compete. Yeah. Everyone is in the. It's a personal growth thing. At the time I got into it, that's what you had to do. That's what some people around me did, so I did mm-hmm. it. Yeah. But I actually loved being in the gym getting bigger and stronger because i was such an imp before that, that <laughs> yeah you know, that i like I picking up atlas process. stones but i'm pretty sure i'm not going to pick up a 550 pound one like brian shaw you know right it's good to have goals in life but it's good to be realistic too yeah, at this but point like, in my okay, life but it's fun pick, you know you know you get up to a 300 pound one well how do i yeah. get 310 what exercises exactly. do i have to do to get 310 a little bit at a time yeah incremental and gains that, and that fun. it makes it fun then exactly you know, when you stop comparing yourself to someone else mm-hmm. and just train for the pure enjoyment of getting making progress for yourself, that's when the real growth starts. It gets much better. I mean, I can see that in your development that you know, historically, you know, York, their bread and butter was in the paper goods. You know, they they sold course books and things like that. And Weeder also, you know, all the all the big companies that magazine I used to have the course Kaz, books i used to have the uh cas quest too perfect so everybody sold programs course books you know and then the, like you mentioned you started out reading those magazine articles and things and, but then, and, and jimmy nichols basement we mm-hmm. did so, some of the exercise on the machine and the rest of it was the uh charles atlas routines it was like dozens perfect. of them charles atlas a classic yep. yeah so at some point though you go from that you know, you must have cataloged enough of education there with those articles and talking with other lifters and things that you just start doing your own thing. And, you know, the repetition of it, did it just set in for you 
mm-hmm. at a certain point where you broke free from the magazines and all those things and you just started doing your own thing? Yeah, I started getting more programming with it with myself. Yeah. So we mentioned, you know, going through, I'm looking at my notes here. You, you went to the Chicago Health Club and then from there you head to the garage gym with the power lifters, Rüdiger, and then Mm -hmm. into uh, quads gym, you know, is it safe to say that by the time you hit the Chicago health club, you're starting to dabble into the programming yourself. And, you know, I just went what I, what I saw in powerlifting USA magazine. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Was it cool the first time you saw yourself in the magazine? Cause you've mentioned it. Yeah. I I think it was, it was, it was just a a little picture. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was my first nationals or YMCA nationals or something. And, um, I made the cover. That's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. So that must've been a nice one to hand to mom and dad, you know, pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Well, they were at the contest too. So exactly. it was in, it was in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, Columbus, Ohio is strength sports history. Big time. Yep. A lot of companies out of there. So mm-hmm. when it comes to that kind of, uh, you know, interesting or just those memorable moments you know this is a memorable moment for me I, you know i mentioned Thanks. before that ah, it's not like i'm a brian shaw or a dave tate in this game i'm a guy who likes history and talks about strength history so it, it's really cool to meet you along the way you mentioned franco colombo mm-hmm. so as a child as a teenager you looked at this guy. Now you're sitting next to him, oh, <laughs> talking was, with him. Great. Who else kind of stands out to you? Those kind of uh, people that along the way you're like, whoa, I just met this person. I mean, I've met and talked to Ronnie Coleman. Oh, uh, lightweight. One time when I met him, I had had my both hips replaced already, but he was way before me. And then okay. he had all the complications with his back. Yeah, yeah. And he was actually pissed and he yelled at me a little bit because I could still squat and deadlift and he couldn't. <laughs> but I mean, he still hits the gym. I've seen, you know, there's a great documentary about him. And then it's, of course, I follow him online too. And, and I, still, I, I mean, there's, still there's doing a lot it. time that goes by whenever I see her or talk to Stan hmm. that uh, my ears aren't perked up like this, listening to everything that comes out. I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll to, to plug his stuff. I'm actually doing the uh, at the Arnold Classic or at uh, Mr. Olympia. He's having a big contest for like strongest gym in America, and a, oh. a whole bunch of great okay. powerlifters and people are going to be there. That's going to be a lot of fun. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. And you know, kind of, I'm sure there's a, a camaraderie there, like we were talking about with the gym mm-hmm. that you were going to, and even now, you know, you're going to Lance's. Yeah. You know, that'd be cool. I love my people there. Do you know if they'll be uh, sending some people out to that? No, no, they won't be sending anyone nah. out. Well, I mean, the big get together I'm looking forward to the drop a plug for something would be the home gym con it's called. Have you heard of home gym con yet? No, it's um, well, we're in this day and age, like I mentioned, it's social media and things mm-hmm. as a home gym lifter. I love, I I obviously chose this. I like the variety that I get in my own home gym. It's tailored to me. It's like, I'm king of the world when I'm in here. I do whatever I want. But on the other hand, yeah, you miss social interaction occasionally. So it's nice to make some buddies online. Mm -hmm. You talk with people, you drop each other comments, you know, different uh, social media sources. You have a lot of people that are just like you. Exactly. You meet your people. (laughs) Yeah, you're you're not the freaky weirdo that you thought you were. Exactly. So the whole concept is to bring all these home gym people out into broad daylight at a convention. So the sponsors of this show, the producers of this show, Garage Gym Radio is from the Garage Gym Experiment account. And Jake, Garage Gym Experiment is putting on Home Gym Con. It's in April. It's in uh, the beautiful French Lick, Indiana, which sounds you know, a little odd, but well, I'm, it's I'm known for south, its convention. I'm in the suburbs on the south side of Chicago. I was just going to say, you're not too far off, and something tells me that Jake would is love there, to have you there. Is Larry Bird going to be I there? Would. I don't know. That's the reach, but if there's someone that could probably pull him in, get him there for us, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be there. I'm going to make the trip out to Indiana. I'm looking forward to meeting people that I've only, you know, talked with online, 
but it'd be cool to actually kind of, you know, hang out. Keep me, keep me filled in. If it's face. not that far, I'd come. I will. It's April 14th through the 16th. I'll send you the information. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, anyone at home, listeners at home, if you type in vintage, you can save a little cash on tickets. Tickets are available at garagegymexperiment.com. And if you're the greatest power lifter of all time, you don't have to worry about tickets. You can just show up. <laughs> now, is, is French Lick more Southern Indiana? You know, I honestly don't know. I had never heard of it. And I asked Jake, like, what in the world? What, what is French Lick Indiana? And as it turns out, as he described it, and he has information on his website, garagedimexperiment.com, about it, that it's the whole town basically is structured around this convention center. That's where they make their money. And that would be fun then. They cater to it. And since you're in town and you're at this convention and everyone's kind of happy to have you there, it's a great place for a convention because people aren't splitting off here, there, everywhere. Everyone's just kind of right there in town. They make it easy getting to and from the hotel, that kind of stuff. No, where are you from? Where are you at now? I'm in Pittsburgh. So in okay. my in my name, Vintage Rates PGA. It's PGA. Yeah, what am I thinking? You did tell me that. No, it's now, all good. I do have a business opening up right over the border from Indiana, Michigan. Mm-hmm. And what's Guess that? what it is. I think I already know what it is because I've been doing my research on you. So I, something tells me that it's uh, the legalized marijuana business. Yes, it is. Is that correct? And, and that I've never has to do dope. with the I've boundary. I've never smoked pot. Yeah. Don't have any inkling to do it. Yeah. But uh, it's a fin- fantastic business and uh, it has a pretty good place for a lot of people. Well, it's legal now in many states mm-hmm. and it's, you know, an avenue that people are exploring. And like you said, people are exploring it and finding, uh, you know, the positive things that have to do with it. So what, you know, what led you to that? How, how did you? Um, just some people I knew were trying to get into it. And okay. um I knew people that knew people and I got involved. So I yeah. became part of the company. Well, I mean, over the span of your career, it, powerlifting, you know, it was on TV. You saw Kaz. That was an inspiration when you saw him on mm-hmm. TV lifting. But on the other hand, it's not one of the main sports. It's not baseball, basketball, hockey. No, but, um, but so many people in sports do it. Exactly. Not realizing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're unbeknownst to them mm-hmm. they're doing it so my question though was how did you you know make ends meet how did you you know were you winning enough people. at a certain point so i used to train people okay so training that was good enough to you know put food on the table and oh yeah and and pay the bills and then you know i'm sure a win at a good at a good meet certainly helped and well, then, you, you develop a better reputation based on your your CV. Gotcha. That makes you look good. Oh, yeah. That, that you actually have credentials. I mean, uh, I think people pay for experience. Hmm. They don't pay for a guy that never did anything yet or hasn't been involved for it. Yeah. And that can be the problem now with a lot of people that do all the online training. You know, they go in one little meet and they say, I am now offering my services I'm an expert. When, all yeah. they're, when, when a lot of times all they're doing is just taking someone else's routine. It's funny you mentioned that, but when I was looking for, you know, the Philippi Cohen, I found just because it was the same parameters and spreadsheet, mm-hmm. it's repeated with other people's names on it. That's hilarious. Yeah. So it's out there, <laughs> you know, so there's more <laughs> names than just Philippi and Cohen on it now. That's funny. Yeah. You know, there's always an enterprising person out there with low morals. Yeah, a scumbag out there. Exactly. So, you know, along the way, you mentioned Weeder. Mm-hmm. You went out, did articles with him, things like that. Yeah, was actually, it... the, the guy who got me the contract with Weeder was Fred Hatfield. Oh, nice. So I used to go out there. Whenever I'd go out to Weederville, mm-hmm. if, I didn't, if I didn't stay out in Santa Monica on the beach, mm-hmm. uh, I would stay with Fred right near the offices. <laughs> That's it's wild because I mean, uh, half field squats and you know, what an yeah. eligible guy. Uh, so the two of you under the same roof <laughs> probably had a couple conversations. Oh my God. That's, was, that's with, pretty with, cool. With Fred, with Fred, there was always Jack Daniels around. Yeah. That probably helped so, the conversations. <laughs> oh yeah. The, the lifts got bigger. Yeah, certainly. And you know, as far as, you know, money and sponsorships and things like that. 
I'm a huge fan when I, when I go to pick up some old weights and things, just the extra stuff sometimes is so interesting to me. I'll, I'll figure it out. Like there were these goofy, like kind of, uh, I guess, weight hooks that someone would use 20, 30 years ago. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is wild. But uh, did you get those kind of offers, product offers? Hey, put your name on this kind of things no, not, along the way. Not too many. If I did, I didn't know about them and I, or I ignored them. Yeah. Uh, Weeder was the basically first one I got in the door with Weeder because just an old fashioned skinny leather belt. He had in every, at the time it was sport Mart mm-hmm. across the country. And Fred called me up and said, Joe Weeder is actually going to call you, Eddie. And I want you to do this for cheap. <laughs> and I guarantee you afterwards, something good will happen. So I did it for cheap. And sure enough, in all these little boxes across the country with my picture on it and my, uh, my endorsement was these little boxes with the belt in it all across, at all these sport marts across the whole country. It was pretty cool. There it is. Well, now I know it's on my want list. I want to find one of those original, uh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> original boxes with Ed's picture on it. That, it funny. Honestly, you never know. There's when I go to pick up stuff from someone's basement and you know, that, yeah, a lot of people, you never know. I, I, exactly. I find stuff, you know, you wouldn't believe that they just kind of throw in there cause they're cleaning out their basement and their kid moved out 30 years ago and left behind all this stuff. So if I ever find one of those, belts and original ed cohen picture i'll reach out i'll let you know i'll sign it, track send it back. Down. nice even better or i'll <laughs> just keep it i'll just keep it and say who the fuck are you yeah who is this guy yeah why are you sending me this dusty old belt yeah. block <laughs> what uh when it comes to um you know that aspect of things i heard you mention how you know the 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 yellow suit the the famous mm-hmm. yellow suit was stolen yeah, in Germany. Oh, that sucks. So or, it's. Or, or, I think no. Wait, Finland. It was stolen. And that you still have the Inzer. You still yeah. have the one that you you got after that. Um, but no, no leads on that case. It hasn't resurfaced. No. You haven't seen it pop up no. on eBay. No, but uh, they did. They definitely didn't pull any records with it, or else I would have saw it. Yeah, exactly. So it's not. It's it's not being used for its intended purpose. It's no, whatever. probably some, some weirdo wearing it around at night. Yeah. And it's uh, up on his wall or something. Yeah, yeah. Framed. But have you had people approach you? Have you had people ask, you know, Hey, you know, I want to buy that yellow suit of yours. I, you know, oh, what yeah, happened to the Adidas my, shoes? Uh, you my, know? The, definitely the deadlift shoes. Some people the want deadlift shoes. Because I could see, you know, there's some strength history museums, for example, not just private collectors, but just, mm-hmm. you know, Richard Soren, for example, at Soren X has this yeah. humongous, you know, big collection. Time collection, big time collection. I wouldn't be surprised if he'd love to have Ed Cohen's shoes sitting there, you know. I think um, a, a friend of mine in Australia has dibs on them if I ever decide to get rid of them. Well, I was going to ask where, where are they headed? So a friend in Australia. Uh, he, he has a gym in Melbourne. Hmm. Uh, pro raw gym okay. so he's he put the dibs on him a long time ago so you heard it here folks if you someday if ed parts with them you're gonna have to take a trip down under yep to go see him eh. have you hung on to anything else your old belt stuff like that i've got my old gym owner's belt hmm. from Claude's. and uh i keep still keep that but i don't i, I don't even use it but i still keep it yeah. It's still got his name written in it, which is pretty cool. That is cool. That's very cool. And then along the way, like, you know, trophies, things like that. What, what became of those along the way? Uh, most of them are like in one of my sister's basements. <laughs> so then if someone I, comes I, over I, your I, sister's place. They're like, Whoa, look yeah, at this I room. Didn't really, I didn't really care about the trophies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Didn't buy, I, I don't really care about them. Well, I didn't mean it from perspective of you displaying yeah. them. I meant it more just of a historical curiosity. Where's where's this trophy that says Ed Cohen on it from whenever, 1984? I'll see if I can find like an old, old one. And uh, I'll get your address and send it out to you. That'd be amazing. I'd, I'd put it right up there in the home gym. That, that just, would be amazing. Super glue it on the front of your car as an emblem. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, part part ways with your Jaguars and your yeah. Rolls Royces. Look what I got here. <laughs> there you go. Vintage. Vintage. The strongest car in Pittsburgh. Yep. Amazing. Well, hey, I don't know if we can make that happen or not, but if it did come true, I'll at least take a picture with it on the front of my car. That'll be cool. Ed, thanks so much for stopping by. I, I mean, oh, you're welcome. No, I, thank you. you. You do an excellent job. and I, I really I, appreciate I, it. I appreciate it more than you can imagine because I like people that know the history of the sport. Well, I, I mean, it comes from a, from a place of respect and love that I just have for it. You know, yeah, I, how, I, how much, how much of know. the world has that now? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to inspire. You know, there you go. I want, with this podcast, I want to give people a little more purpose behind what they're doing because I think, you know, when you're in your gym, it's mental as much as physical. So if you know, this bar had a history to it. Maybe you'll lift it a little more. I remember one time I was in one of the world gyms in <coughs> Columbus, Ohio, mm-hmm. and they had the original set that uh, Vasily Alexeyev put 500 oh, wow. pounds over his head with. That's something. I, That's I would like cool. to see that. That is yeah. very cool. Yeah. You we just kind of want to reach, reach down and just touch it a little bit. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> York Barbell has a great museum I plan to go to soon. Um, why it's, why it's still up. there. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, I collect their vintage plates for a reason, to put it mildly. But when it comes to you know guys like me, I'm an average guy working out in his basement. What's your best advice for the home gym lifter? Because you know when it, what the other thing I've realized about the social media kind of era is that not many of these you know, posters are really competing or elite. You know, a lot of them are just people that are trying to stay fit, trying to yeah. stay healthy. So coming from, you know, the greatest power lifter well, of all you, time, uh, what's your advice? Technique, pick the right weights and take your time. I'm John it down now. So technique, pick the right weights, right weights, I should say. And I love the last one. I think the best, take your time. That's when uh, you, when you take your time, yeah you end up building a better base all along the way. I, I wish I could have heard that, you know, when I was 18. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I, I, I was kind of like in the uh, power bodybuilding type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was never without that because I wanted to look good and be, and be strong. Sure. And I figured if, if I got to be the strongest I could be, I would look pretty good anyway. So – I didn't obsess on the bodybuilding part, but I did still did all the exercises because I did not want to be weak in any one area. Yeah. I mean, I find it fascinating that you paid attention. You didn't just, you know, accessories weren't an afterthought. You paid attention to trying to progress and trying to peak with those two and yep. see how much can I do with my rows or whatever it might be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rows or inclines or shoulder presses or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're putting in the work. Why not? You got to. And so technique, you know, take your time. Those are all great pieces of advice for the home gym lifter. My piece of advice would be if you don't to follow Ed Cohen on Instagram, um, you know, you, you probably, if you're still listening this far, you can see that he's not hawking a bunch of products to you or anything like that. And all you, you know, got to do is just ask me it's a good question. Content. I usually always get back to you. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not putting down anyone selling any products. I mean, I said it myself. I have some yeah. affiliates and things, but I'm just saying as a compliment to you that it was, I think when I first joined Instagram, you were one of the first people I followed that it, it's, it's just good content. I learned a lot. I'm like, Hey, open the taint. What is that? Like I, you know, it's when, just when I, when I first, it was there Mark Bell's podcast mm-hmm. and I'm sitting in his living room. He said something about Instagram. I go, what's that? He goes, give me your phone. Uh, and he put me on Instagram and made up my account. And like in a day and a half, I already had 32,000 or something. There you go. Home gym history. That's where it came from. You know, yeah. it but I've never, I've never, I've never tried to get followers. You know, yeah. I just try to put out some cool stuff now and then. I think there's, you know, like you said, the experience of things and just being consistent and putting out the content is you know why I like following you on there. So if you don't follow Ed Cohen, get on there, check him out. How can I figure out, you know, 
other than following you on Instagram, you know, do you, do you, when you're going to do a, a, a seminar somewhere, is that where you would post Usually it? I put it up. I'll put it up on Instagram. Then I'm going to be okay. at a certain place. Gotcha. And do you typically, you know, is it just as they come to you or do you have a certain, you know, time of year you as, like as to do ones? To it, as they come to me, if I have the time, then okay. I usually talk to someone when we figure something out. Gotcha. And then I saw recently the Cohen Classic. Yeah, uh, um, that's in Omaha, Nebraska at Omaha Barbell. Okay. And that's been going on for a little while now, right? Yeah, a couple of years. years. couple yeah. years. And, you know, is it safe to say that, you know, this is, it's got your name on it. So this is a, a well, pretty cool I event. The, I, tr- I trust the guy, Brett, that runs it, Brett mm-hmm. Carter. And he has a great group of people that help him out. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, we don't really take a lot of ring- any ringers. Okay. So you're not going to have someone who's super strong. Yeah. It's a lot of local and a lot of uh, people in the area or just someone that just might want to travel to come to a really good, fun, great judge meet. Cause I'm the head judge. Yeah. And there's uh people that I'm friends with, you know, on Instagram that I know that, you know, they like to go compete somewhere because it's fun to travel and just kind of mm-hmm. head somewhere. And that sounds like it'd be a good time. I think we open it up in December sometimes Okay. sometime and uh, Omaha Barbo will have the, uh, they put it out first and I share it. And then okay. we, we only take, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 lifters and that's it. Well, this podcast should time well with that because uh, this should drop right about mid December. So it should time well with that. Uh, or I shouldn't say that prior to December. So I'll make sure to attach the link and yeah. all that once you publicize it. And, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll put, I'll put this out there. I want and, people to see it. And I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, the Cohen Classic, I'll make sure to spread the word because, yeah, I know a couple of people that they might be into it. It's fun. Yeah, exactly. You got to have fun. I mean, our, our announce, one of our announcers, uh, uh, John Hansen, mm-hmm. he's a multi-BJJ world champion. And the girl who does our table and announces also is Benika Brown, who's probably the, oh, man. one of the greatest female lifters ever. Absolutely. And like I said, the, the array of people that we have helping us is, is awesome. And are you there to judge? What are you doing? And I'm head there? judge. Your head judge. Perfect. So, you know, you can't get better feedback than that really? <laughs> from the goat. You're either going to give, <laughs> you're going to give the lift or not. So, yeah. No gifts. Yeah, exactly. No gifts. You're, you're, <laughs> you're going to judge their lift. And you got to lock out your deadlifts. No soft lockouts. Yeah. I heard you mention now, uh, you know, there's only one there that you felt like you cut a squat and uh, yeah. you don't, you don't count that one. You know, nope. it's that, that those little bits of integrity mean a lot, you know, so having fun, being nice. Well, those are you, all the things heard, that I heard, respect. You heard what Dave Tate said uh, mm-hmm. to Mike Trashier. I, mm-hmm. I lifted to my standard. I can't lift to everyone else's standard. It's mine. I got a conscience. Exactly. And that's, you reminded me before we jump off here, I, you know, I don't have any association other than respect for these different podcasts, but in preparing for this one, I particularly enjoyed Dave Tate table talk. I'll drop a link for it. If you enjoyed this podcast, jump on there and hear the Ed Cohen episode. You can consider also going to the Brian Shaw podcast in your Ed Cohen studies. This is like a college course. The, laying the, out the Brian here. Shaw is Brian found out I was, coming out there for a seminar mm-hmm. on the Saturday and he messaged me and he said, would you want to do my podcast? I said, okay. And then as I'm getting my luggage, all of a sudden I turn around and there's Nick best. <laughs> he he sent his henchmen. We, yeah. Yeah. And Nick has always been a phenomenal human being besides strong as shit. What a nice guy. He yeah. is. And then, uh, I mean, I, I think, Nick probably had to help me get up in Brian's truck. <laughs> that that would have been interesting to see. Yeah. And I think we, we I think we ate three times be, twice before the podcast was done, and then another <laughs> time when he dropped me off at the my hotel. But it was great. It was it was really 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 cool. Well, you talk about longevity in your career. Nick's now. I mean, I follow him. I don't know. Him he's personally, in his fifties, but he's I follow star. him, and he is a beast. And he's now in competing in Master Strongman, yeah. and he's you know. And, him, him and Grand Higa, yeah. the Higa Monster. Higa mm-hmm. Monster is one of the hardest working guys I've ever seen in my life. Both those guys will be in Vegas for the Mr. Olympia for the, the stance contest, along oh, with like cool. uh, 
you know, Joe, Joe, Joe Sullivan and Briani and a mm-hmm. whole bunch of other people. That'll be very cool. And then you mentioned Mark Bell. I reached way back. I listened to that podcast. I know Mark, Mark, and Mark, Mark will probably be at the Olympia. I'm sure him yeah. and Chris will be there. Well, I'll drop a link for the podcast I'm referencing there too, that it's a cool one because you're lifting with him and you know, you're and his brother's behind the camera and you're lifting with him. So you're in real time kind of talking through things as the two of you are going back and forth doing sets. And yeah, that's, uh, where, that's where I, that's where I made up open your taint. Exactly. So the origin of the famous phrase. Yeah. So, you know, I'll drop a link for that one too. And then I'd be remiss, you know, I'm wearing their t-shirt right now. The Massonomics boys, um, oh, those guys are hilarious. You they, got into some good stories on there. They yeah. make fun of me all the time, and, <laughs> and I love it. I love them, too. You know, and so I couldn't end this episode without mentioning the Massonomics podcast, and I'll leave a link for the Ed Cohen episode for that, too, because you tell some amazing stories, and I won't do well, it justice to retell them. I'll the, just say the, go the, there and listen. The next yeah. time I see those guys, they are getting their ass kicked. I'm, yeah. I'm putting them in some <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They better watch out. But, uh, you know, the stuff in with the safari and various other stories that you told on there are great. And I'll just leave that little hint to go listen to the Massanomics episode in your studies of Edco. And yeah, if you I've been know pretty more. lucky along the way to have cool stories that met. I mean, and I met cool people besides, you know, you got Brian Shaw and Thor and Nick Best and yeah. Stan and Mark Bell and Lane Norton and Mike Isretel and you you name it. I mean, uh, yeah. all those top bodybuilders. Flex Lewis, probably one of the coolest guys you could ever meet. Yeah, that would be very cool. Yeah. Well, well, I'll tell you what, sir. You are now, you know, definitely a story that I'll tell the rest of my life, getting a chance, even though it's virtual, to chat with you. So I look forward you to hopefully know, meeting I might, you I might in see person. You quick. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to lure you to Home Gym Con. I'll get you the information on it. I might if be you able to, you know, you know, uh, Stan might even come too. I can usually get him to come somewhere that's that's cool for yeah. for fun, just to get out. It's going to be a bunch of home gym lifters, you know, hanging out, having a good time, trying to learn something, trying to see what's out there. So yeah, it's and you two would definitely be people to learn from, and so I would love that. So I'll get you the information on that, and who knows, yeah. maybe we'll meet in person. And if you're ever coming through Pittsburgh, you're always welcome. No so, problem, dude. Thank I you so much for having me on. I had a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care, bud. And right. you have my number. I and, do. And, and stuff. So if you ever, when you lift and you mm-hmm. record yourself, yeah. you can send me the video and I'll break it down for you. That, I do that's that, a I gift. I do that to everyone for free. That, and that's amazing to me. It's like your, your public service to the lifting community, you know? Um, it, it's called the gift of giving. You yeah, make exactly. you feel really good when you can help people. Exactly. It's, it's a good feeling. So it's... Yep. It's an amazing thing, and I will certainly – I'll be recording some lifts for the, the uh, garage gym competition, so I'll make sure I send some over to you. Be, yeah, way beforehand so I can – we can yeah, fix you. Exactly. Before. You got you to gotta fix me first so I can do something yeah. in that competition. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> I appreciate it, sir. You're welcome. Take care, buddy. All right. Bye-bye.